But in that very randomness lies the weakness of the terrorist. If he succeeds in killing a few people, but does not succeed in frightening everyone else, he will have failed. Suppose, for example, there was a plausible report that terrorists were going to strike a shopping mall somewhere in America next Tuesday. What do you think will happen? Probably most people would stay home and not go shopping, and that's what the terrorist wants. He wants to know he can frighten us away from doing what we want to do. But suppose, instead of saying home, suppose we said to ourselves, there are 50,000 shopping malls in the United States. Even if the threat is real, the odds are 50,000 to one it won't be the one I'm at. I'm in more danger driving to the mall than I am from a terrorist bomb. The only thing we can do to defeat terrorism is to withhold from them the one thing they are after, the power to scare us out of our normal lives. I remember the Israeli man whose daughter was badly injured in a bus bombing, saying to a reporter, there are worse things in life than being killed, and one of them is to live every day of your life in fear. But what about more personal fears? Our dread of growing old and no longer to be able to do the things we give our lives meaning with, and looming over them all, the fear of death. Many psychologists believe that the fear of death is the mother of all fears. All living things are fated to die, but only human beings know that. And that knowledge casts a shadow over all of our days, putting us in the valley of the shadow of death. We try so hard to achieve something, to leave something behind, to raise children who will perpetuate our names and our values, to do something memorable at work that our name will be attached to as a way of defeating mortality. We exercise, we monitor our cholesterol, but in the end, one fate awaits us all. Good people die, vegetarians die, people who pray every day die. If we can't cheat death, is there something we can do about the fear of death? In my years as a congregational rabbi, I have sat at the bedsides of many people who knew that they were on the brink of dying. I sat at the bedside of my 14-year-old son during the last days of his life, and they all taught me the same important lesson. Very old, very sick people are not really afraid of death. When you're very sick, death may be the only cure for what ails you. What really frightens people who are running out of time is not the fear of death, but the fear of not having lived, of having wasted one's life without ever doing anything memorable that would grant them posthumous immortality. So the cure for the fear of death is to be able to focus on something you did that you can feel proud of leaving behind. If you didn't make a lot of money at work, were you a dedicated worker? Were you a good friend and neighbor? Focus on the kind of husband or wife you were, the kind of parent you were, and start doing that now, so that when time is running out, you will never have reason to fear that you wasted it. Death is the end of life, only the way a period is the end of a sentence. It doesn't empty the sentence of meaning, it defines what the sentence was saying. How then shall we cope with the fear of death, the fear of misfortune, the fear of people out there to hurt us? Do it as people of faith have always done it, by turning to God to give us what we need. Not a God who guarantees happy endings, not a God who promises that nothing bad will ever happen to us because we're good people, but a God who promises that no matter what happens, we will be able to handle it, and we'll be able to handle it because there are resources within us and friends around us, and they will see us through. Yes, it's a very scary world out there, but our faith in ourselves and our faith in God enables us to say, I will not be afraid. Mm -hmm.